Welcome back to our third article in our series on MoGraph. Today our focus will be the effectors. If you have followed the last two articles, you already have seen me use them. First allow me to give you a walkthrough tour on features and parameters that are the same for all effectors. The easiest and most obvious to understand setting is the strength. This defines how strongly an effector influences a cloner, a text object or any other of MoGraph's objects. You may ask why there is even such a setting. Isn't it clear that when I apply an effector to a cloner for instance, I want to control the cloner using this effector? Yes and no. Because MoGraph is modular, one effector can influence multiple other MoGraph objects. You may not always be able to adjust the properties of those objects the way you possibly need them. Here the effector strength parameter comes in handy. For example, think of a cloner that has multiple effectors applied. The transform properties of the cloner itself should not be modified, because they define the maximum amount of the transformation. However, let's say one of your effectors is a random effector and shall only have a very subtle effect. Instead of changing the settings of your cloner, you simply take down the strength of your random effector. The other effectors are not influenced by this. The other way around, of course multiple cloners can share the same effector. So you have similar strength controls on each of MoGraph's objects. When you have multiple effectors applied, multiple sliders will become available. The next important settings are the minimum and maximum settings, short, min and max. They too define how an effector influences your objects by defining an upper and lower threshold. As you can see, each effector type uses different minimum and maximum default settings. You are of course free to change them to your liking and your needs. You should take care however to not mistweak them. I learned this myself the hard way because especially once you start to working with colors, which we will cover a little later, the minimum and maximum settings can be very tricky. They also have an influence on the fall of behavior, so it's not all that easy. But don't let me confuse you. I will explain it all when it is time. By clicking on the parameter tab, you gain access to a series of settings that could be considered the true power behind the effectors. The entire panel has a striking similarity to the transform panel of the cloners. The transform properties are perhaps the most easy to grasp so let's start with those. You can see that those consist of the position, scale and rotation properties. In my example I have set up the effectors in such a way that each of them only affects one property. The random effector only manipulates position. The step effector is set to influence scale and finally the time effector will give us a continuous rotation. By disabling the other effectors you can see the individual effect of each on its own. You can of course also change multiple properties with only one effector. You have however to be aware that when you use only one effector to control all properties, you give up a lot of your power. You possibly have to add many more keyframes and spend a lot of time tweaking your parameters more precisely than you would when you were using multiple effectors. The more complex your setup gets, the more efficient it is to use multiple effectors. An important setting to consider when using multiple effectors is the weight transform. In the scene currently on screen, you can see that all cubes are rotating uniformly. Their positions are varied using a random effector. What were to happen if we wanted to make the rotation less regular? We only have two options. Either we add more effectors or we can find a way to tweak our existing effectors. We will try the latter one. The thing that's going to help us here is the weight transform. All of MoGraph's internal values are calculated in some way or the other. Since it's pure mathematics, this means same conditions yield same results. We can notice that, that when different clones get influenced by the same effector, they will share the same properties of the effector. If you want to create regular patterns, this is of course okay, but in not so few situations it can be undesirable because it looks less natural than some randomness. The weight transform provides you with a means of changing those internal values in a more organic fashion. The results of this operation are particularly noticeable on the random effector. On other effector types they are not that clear. 
With our little adjustment in place, our cubes will now rotate with different velocities. If I turn the ray transform back down, they will again move in unison. As you can imagine, by simply animating this one parameter, you can create interesting animations that transition from random movement to regular formations. Another matter of not so minor importance when using multiple effectors is their stacking order inside the cloner object. This has a great relevance for the transform space and transform mode settings, which I will explain next. Let me show you what I mean. Our example with the rotating cubes is still up on the screen. The initial setup has the random cloner before the time effector. This means they are first moved into position and only after that is the rotation applied to them. When I rearrange their stacking, this changes. The rotation is now applied first and after that they are moved in position. You can clearly see that the results are different. Even more so if we use the way transform again. When I change the stacking order back to the way it was, the behavior of my clones also changes. The transform mode defines how multiple effector operations are stacked on top of each other. Or more precisely, how their values are accumulated. By default, the transform mode is always set to relative. This is about right 90% of the time. The idea behind the relative mode is that you want to introduce some variation in your cloners, but not completely control their creation parameters. So if you had for instance a cube that is too large, you would still adjust or scale the cube outside the effector instead of making excessive adjustments to the effector itself. Again, this is of special importance when using multiple effectors. In my sample scene, I'm using a step effector to actually make my cubes smaller. On top of that, I have applied a random effector. This one will also vary the scale in the same range as the step effector, but preferably it shall scale all objects up. That's why I'm using a positive value here. Both effectors are used in relative mode. Why is this? If I were using my random effector in absolute mode, there is an imminent danger that some of my clones will disappear, because they will be scaled so small that they are practically invisible. The relative mode cannot entirely avoid this effect, but it will not appear as often. The absolute mode will spread your defined value range across all clones. For this it bases its calculations on the internal index values of the clones. With the scale property, this mode isn't particularly useful, but if you were to use it for instance with the position property, your clones would be spread in world space rather than relative to the original position in the cloner. Similar to the absolute mode, the remap mode works. It operates even more strictly. In our scale example, it will remap all values from 0 to 0 0.8, which means that cubes that are already scaled very small by the step effector also may completely disappear once we apply the random effector. So all in all, in most situations it is wise to stick with the relative mode. However, feel free to experiment with the other modes as well. In some situations, they can be just right. When using multiple effectors, a setting that is very strongly influenced by the stacking order of those effectors is the transform space behavior. To make it a little easier to explain this, I have tried to visualize the underlying grid of the cloner. The spheres on this grid represent the pivot points of each individual clone. When I reactivate the effectors, you can see that the clones move away from those pivot points according to the effector settings. The positional change is caused by the random effector. But as you can see, we also have a time effector. Just as in our other examples, this will make our cubes rotate. My initial transform space for the random effector is the node space. This is also the default setting. The node space is equivalent to my grid. Because the random effector causes an offset, my cubes will orbit around the pivot points in the grid. When I change my transform space to object, the pivot point or axis center as it is known to Cinema 4D users of the original object will be used. The resulting change in animation is quite evident. Keep in mind that when you use multiple effectors, the transform spaces are always calculated based on the previous effector. In our example, the random effector defines the position of the rotation centers and the time effector will effectively use those centers.
To further illustrate my point, I have created another example, this time using a spline effector. Just like in the other example, the random effector is set to use node space. This will make our cubes with the spikes rotate around the helix perpendicular to the path. When I switch the random effector to object mode, they will stay in their place and rotate around themselves. As you may have noticed, there is also a third mode called effector. In most cases, the results of this mode will be identical to using object mode. Personally, I haven't encountered a situation where the effector mode would have made any difference. You should always take care to plan the stacking order of your effectors. Our example with the spline would be especially critical. If our spline effector wasn't the first of them all, we wouldn't be able to pin down our clones on our spline. You can try this for yourself. A seemingly rather unimportant setting is the modify clone setting. I say seemingly because in some situations it's actually the only setting that will give you the desired result. I have again created a scene just using a random and a time effector, but this time my cloner object is set to object and it uses two different clones. In its original configuration, I'm not modifying any parameter of the clones except for an automated rotation. However, since I'm using a random effector, the distribution of the two clone types shouldn't be that even. So either something is wrong or we forgot to activate a setting. Modify clone is exactly that. By changing the value from zero to anything higher, the distribution pattern will change. If we take the value down to zero again, our pattern will become regular. This is one of the hidden powers of this setting. Just as with the random effector, it can produce similar results with other effector types. If you remember, at one point when we were dealing with cloners, I told you about the sort mode. Modify clone is of crucial importance there. You will finally get to see an example of this in our fourth video. So bear with me just that little bit longer. Another point where the modify clone is very important is when you use the multi shader. You will have an entire article on the shading part later in the series, so you will definitely hear something about it then. The next setting is something that I can only describe as cool. Yes, I rarely use those words, but trust me, I wouldn't use it if it really wasn't that terribly useful. This is best explained by providing a step-by-step -step example. So listen carefully. I have created a box shape. Since I intend to bend it, I have added some more subdivisions along the y-axis. To that box object, I have applied a bend deformer. I have adjusted the size of the band deformer so it fits snugly onto our object. When I scrub through the timeline, you can see that I have animated the strength parameter. This is just a short 50 frame long animation. The only adjustment that I have made is to ease in the last keyframe. That will make the unrolling less abrupt once it stops. I have put the cube inside a cloner object, set to grid array. All of my cubes are animating in unison. To prevent them from intersect with each other, I have added in step effector that will introduce an offset between rows. Now comes the cool part. I have added another step effector and on that effector not only have I enabled the scale property, but I also have changed the time offset value from 0 to 10 frames. As you can see, the unrolling of my cubes becomes a sequential operation. It now resembles some kind of a laola wave. If you know me, you know that I don't like too much regularity. So again, I have added a random effector. I use no other parameters on my random effector except for the time offset again. This I have set to 6 frames. This is a value large enough to yield distinct differences, but it is also small enough to not completely destroy my wave animation. Using the time offset, you can create pretty complex effects. It can even affect entire hierarchies. So in our example, we could for instance replace our cubes with flowers and have them unroll and grow. Another example might be tentacles of sea anemone growing on coral reefs. A setting that is very powerful but also has the potential to cause a lot of aggravation is the color setting. Let me explain. This is the part about MoCraft that I like the least. Nonetheless, let me try to explain it in simple terms to you. Each effector can apply color to clones. It does this similar to how it applies the other parameters. The setting you will use most of the time is color with effector alpha. The alpha channel is calculated based on the index of the cloner, which in turn is treated as a grayscale map internally in MoGraph. 
each shade of gray represents a certain alpha transparency. When using an effector, this is reflected by the opacity of the color you define on the effector. So where the underlying grayscale map is totally white, your color will be opaque and completely replace the base color. Where it is black, it will be completely transparent and the base color will show through. The steps in between will have tones within that color range. Knowing that, you are also beginning to see a problem with that approach. Since the effector color is mixed with the base color, it is very difficult to predict which clone will have which color. As long as you use only white, black and other grayscale values, it's kind of okay, but as soon as you start using other colors as the base color of your cloners, it becomes really difficult. Somehow you will always end up having colors in between that you don't like. That is compounded by the fact that when you add more effectors, you have to deal with even more unwanted color blending. This can become really frustrating after a while. Another problem is that all the blending is dependent on the minimum and maximum settings of the effector. If you have an effector that uses negative minimum values, your colors will effectively become inverted. That is completely undesirable, so be warned. When you switch the mode to use color, but no alpha, you do no longer have the blending problem, but in that case, all of your clones will get the same color. This is also not what you want in many situations. A potential solution to the dilemma could be the shader effector. As the name says, it allows you to use Cinema 4D's shaders and textures. This can be anything from an image texture to a procedural shader. For this to work, you need to set your color mode to effector color and alpha or just effector color. Your clones will then pick up a color from the shader based on their position relative to the texture or shader. You can define your shader effector in two ways. Either you use a custom shader, or you can use any material that already exists in your scene. I have opted to use a custom shader. I have applied a simple multicolored gradient. The alpha channel used by the shader effector can be defined on a set of parameters. By default it is a medium gray, which means that all colors will be blended 50% with the cloner's base color. In our example, our intense blue, red and yellow tones will become equivalent pastel tones, because we have set our cloner base color to white. You can also use each color component separately to function as an alpha channel. Depending on what color you choose, the results will be different. Of course you are not limited to using either or the other method. It is quite possible to combine the shader effector with the coloring modes of the other effectors. In addition to that, you can also use the blending modes you already know from the material editor, which are add, subtract, multiply and divide. This can create some interesting color combinations. But as I said, it is not particularly predictable and requires a lot of experimentation. Basically what I'm saying here is that you never really can plan your colors unless you use images with proper alpha. A function of the effectors that is not at all that obvious is that they can be used as deformers. For this to work, you need to place your effector below the object that is going to be deformed. On the deformer tab of the effector, you then need to choose one of the deformation modes. My first example for this is a simple cube to which I have applied a random effector. The random effector is set to point mode. This means each of the vertices of my cube will be affected according to the settings I make on the random effector. When I change my settings, my deformation will also change. There are two other modes available. The object mode is intended if you have created a compound object by using the connect function. Each contiguous mesh inside this compound object will then be treated as one whole unit. Similarly will the polygon mode work on each polygon separately. This is illustrated in the manual, where each polygon will be moved individually if you have separated them using the break apart function. For our examples, Let's stick with the point mode. To show you that you not only can create random deformations, I have created a second example. This time I'm using a spline effector. My spline is a star shape that I have bent in 3D space using the wrap deformer. I'm using a disk primitive that is supposed to conform to that star shape. It kind of works, but as you can also see, it still is dependent on the point order of the spline. So the first point of the polygon disk will be aligned with the first point of the spline. This creates a rather crooked but also interesting shape. By adjusting the settings of the disk, it can be smoothed out or roughened up. 
Since it is based entirely on deformation, it will also update if you adjust the spline. If you experiment a little, I'm sure you can come up with some interesting shapes that you had never thought possible. Effectors are nice, but they wouldn't be as useful if there wasn't a way to limit their influence. We have already gotten to know some of those means of control, but ultimately they are limited because they always only work inside the effector. To limit the range of an effector itself, falloffs are used. There are several types to choose from. By default, the falloff is infinite, meaning it doesn't decay at all. In this mode, the only way to get some control is adjusting the weight of the falloff. This is of course not particularly powerful, because you can control the influence of an effector in many other places already. The next type in the list is the box falloff. When you choose that type, you can interactively adjust all parameters using handles in the viewport. You can also adjust them numerically on the panel. If you invert the falloff, all clones inside the falloff area will not be affected, but instead the clones outside will be. The falloff itself is defined by an inner and outer range that defaults to 50%. So if you have, as in our example, a box that is 100 by 100 by 100 meters, the falloff will start at 50 meters and be at zero at 100 meters. By defining a spline profile, you can have falloffs that are not linear. Similar to the box falloff, the cylinder falloff works. In our example, the difference is not that noticeable, but if you have more clones, it becomes more clear. Next on the list is the linear falloff. It is unique in that, unlike the other falloffs, it more or less defines a border where before the falloff the clones are unaffected and after the falloff the clones take their position defined by the effector. The area in between the upper and lower limit acts as some kind of transition area to guarantee smooth animation. In particular, with this type of falloff, rotation also becomes important. Lastly, there is also a spherical falloff. While our other falloffs work more or less two-dimensionally, the sphere falloff can best be illustrated by adding a few more clones along the y-axis. So let me do just that. When I move my effector through the clones, you can get an idea how they are affected. For those that can never have enough falloff types, there are also custom falloffs. The mode for this is called source. You can use either spline objects or thinking particles emitters. Since I don't have thinking particles yet, I have to limit myself to using spline shapes. In my scene, I have put my spline inside a sweep knobs object for you to illustrate the falloff ranges used. This is not a requirement, you can use any spline without having to put them in another object. As you can but see, I'm, I'm using custom shape. falloff shape. If I want to move instead. my falloff I around, can adjust the sample I do not distance move the of effector spline any time I like. The sample distance is always calculated perpendicular to the spline shape. So you can even use three-dimensional splines such as the helix or splines in combinations with deformers. An interesting use for custom shapes, for example, could be if you wanted to make text appear in an otherwise random cloud of clones. With this, let me finish my third article. I hope I have provided a satisfactory overview about the functions of the effectors. In our next and fourth article, we will put that knowledge about effectors to good use. I hope to see you then. Bye bye.